Well, once again, Jesus' critics are on the prowl, seeking to trip him up in a way that they can use to discredit him, or worse. So his critics try to get him, Jesus, in, into a debate of Jewish purity laws. They accuse Jesus' followers of moral laxity in not properly washing their hands, making themselves ritually pure before partaking of a meal. Hey, their concern is not hygiene or germs, but rather the ritual obedience to the teachings of Holy Scripture. To tell the truth, lots of people did not follow the letter of the dietary and purity laws of Israel, but the Pharisees, at least, as they are depicted by Mark, are sticklers for following every jot, every tittle of the law's demands. The law, Torah, they knew, is a gift that has been given by God to help us Jews get close to God, to help humanity and God do business with one another. Down through the ages, obedience to Torah, the law, or better translated, the way, the path, the, the spiritual instruction. This had preserved Israel as Israel, despite centuries of Gentile persecution. In charging Jesus' followers with nonchalance in regard to the law, Jesus' critics were making a serious charge against Jesus. And Jesus takes their charge seriously. He does not dismiss their concerns. Uh, Jesus says nothing to denigrate the Jewish purity laws. Indeed, in this Sunday's gospel, Jesus intensifies the demands of the law by saying that we ought not get hung up on outward obedience, but we ought to be concerned with the heart, inward, deep obedience to God. Jesus quotes, Isaiah's criticism of, of those of us who honor God with our lips, uh, saying all the right things about God, but then we fail to honor God with our hearts. Then Jesus seems to warn the crowd gathered there not to get fixated upon or, or take pride in the externals of religion and to ignore the internal disposition. I read recently that what most 20-somethings look for in a sermon is authenticity. Well, as a preacher, I, I got nervous. I, mean, I think that in what I preach to you, I, I'm being quite authentic. Uh, this is what I really feel led to say to you, but, and yet, maybe I'd be the last person in the world to know when I'm being inauthentic. Talk about the need for authenticity in preaching makes me nervous. Ah, uh, and yet, I need to get over my nervousness because, well, it's perfectly understandable and even necessary for you as listeners to believe that there's a congruence between what I preach and how I am internally disposed toward what I preach, right? Right? Soon after I read that study about preaching and authenticity, a 20-something said to me, I have trouble believing that our pastor, not me, of course, but a guy I know, really cares about what he is telling me in a sermon. Well, that's a major problem. Where am I internally with what appears externally upon my lips. When I was in seminary, there was much pressure put on us to not focus so much on the subjective internal aspects of faith in order to put more stress upon the external, systemic, legislative embodiment of our faith. Don't just love your neighbor. Do those things that show you love the whole neighborhood was the slogan I heard. I don't care what Billy Graham says, said another. It's not enough to, 
to get your heart right. No, you need to work for systemic solutions to social injustice. That's what you need to do. Well, I, I believe much of that. But I also believe that it makes a difference where my heart is, my own internal commitment is on a given social issue. Where am I down deep on this particular issue? Well, that's a fair question. I remember as a seminarian working in a ministry that sought workable, uh, uh, though radical, legislative solutions to the problems of racial divide in America. We were trying to make our faith more than just a matter of, of good intentions, internal disposition. We had a number of laws. We were working to get the state legislature to pass. And yet, I, I soon discovered that the person leading this effort to produce uh, systemic social change was a scoundrel in his personal life. He mistreated women, abused women who were his subordinates in the ministry we were engaged in. <laughs> well, when, when I expressed my concerns to a coworker, he said, hey, who cares what he does in his personal life as, as long as he works for justice for the poor? Isn't that the important thing? Well, Yes, but isn't it also important that an immoral person is attempting to work moral good? Or as Jesus put it, uh, what about the heart? Something within me makes me want to believe that I could have a happy, productive life if it were not for my unfortunate circumstances, my unhappy context, the externals of my situation. Uh, for instance, uh, you may know that I'm a reasonably cheerful, positive person. But then you come along with your criticism and your negative thinking, sometimes about my preaching, and well, well then cheerful me is just dragged down to doleful, negative, critical you. But let me be more honest. Sometimes I'm guilty of blaming things on my externals. That is, the people around me, forces beyond my control, the systems that victimize me. When in reality, it's my internal, that is my heart, that's the problem. I remember going with one of my church members uh, to an alcohol treatment counselor. I was encouraging her. Uh, to go with me as her conscientious pastor so that we could find out how to get help with her husband's alcoholism. We told the counselor about her husband's problem and behavior and, and asked, now what can we do to help him? The counselor shot back, seems to me like it's you that have a problem. I haven't seen any evidence that your husband thinks he has a problem. Your husband isn't here right now. You got no control over his behavior. What you do have some control over is yourself. Maybe you can't change your husband at this point, but you can change your own attitude. You can establish boundaries about what you will and you will you not do. <laughs> or, as Jesus might put it, you can change your heart even if you can't change an addicted husband. And, uh, and maybe that may be one reason why you're here this morning. You want to be in a place, a, a context where God can get to you and can do some work on your heart. You're caught in situations that you can't change. But you have a better chance of changing yourself than others. You may be unable to change your world, but with God's help, maybe your heart can change. It, it seems to me that 
that, that old excuse you used to hear, oh, the devil made me do it, is under assault by Jesus here. We, we need not have recourse to some satanic source of our evil. It's in us. Our problem may not be the, the fix the world is in, but rather the fix that we are in internally, deep within, in the heart. But furthermore, we meet no evil intentions out there in the world or in the world's miscreants, then we have not first met within ourselves. As William Golden, that author of the book Lord of the Flies, put it, human beings make evil the same way bees make honey. Some of us are conditioned to think that the way we do something about the evil in the world is exclusively through legislative action, a political change, systemic solutions, laws, rules. But this week's gospel suggests that the evil we find in the world starts with us. If we're serious about transforming the world's evil, maybe we need to begin personally in admission and confrontation with our own evil. There is sin and evil in our crooked systems. That's true. But there's also sin in our crooked little hearts, too. And that's the sin that Jesus seems to go after in this Sunday's Gospel. G.K. Chesterton was once asked by a London magazine uh, that was devoting an issue to the theme, What's Wrong with the World? Chesterton, great essayist that he was, replied with a two-sentence contribution. <laughs> What's wrong with the world? Me. And what are you going to do about that perplexing problem? How, how can we fix what's wrong within us? I think implied in this morning's scripture is, well, we can listen to Jesus. You maybe have come to church this morning hoping for a few uplifting ideas and an opportunity for you calmly to consider some religious beliefs and practices. <laughs> and then Jesus turns the discussion back upon us, forcing us to look within to examine ourselves, to open up our hearts for self-reflection. St. Augustine defined the Christian life as long-term training in desiring the right things in the right way for the right reasons. I think Augustine agreed with Jesus that what causes us grief is not so much the wicked world and its impact upon us, but rather our own internal misdirected wants, our corrupted desires. <laughs> so uh, here you are, you, you come to church on a late August morning and you listen to Jesus, who warns us not about attending to the externals of the faith, looking good out there, following the rules and all, and neglecting the internals. We are here looking toward Jesus, only to be surprised that he turns our gaze back upon ourselves. I got a friend who uh, had God lay upon his heart a concern about racism 